Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a special weekend of programming by the James Renwick Alliance for Craft. I'm Rebecca Ravenel, the chair of the D Distinguished Artist Series. And uh, the JRA Craft is all about uh, pro promoting craft and craft artists through connoisseurship, education, um, appreciation of American craft. Uh, we host a lot of lectures and travel and uh, other events. For more information on our upcoming events, you can go to jra.org and check us out. So I want to thank you again to everybody for being here. Thank you to uh, Shaniqua and Jennifer, who are our guest artists today. And also I want to thank our partner in these lectures, the American University Museum at the Katz and Arts Center. So this year, in honor of uh, JRA Craft's 40th anniversary and the 25th anniversary of the Center for Craft, we've uh, partnered to uh, combine our most well-known programs for one celebratory season. Uh, we invited four of our JRA Craft Distinguished Artist Series past presenters uh, to come back and pair with four emerging artists uh, recognized by the Center for Crafts Wingate Lamar Fellowship. So uh, through these pairings, we wanted to take a look at um, kind of a wide time span of craft and explore differences in commonality through decades in uh, technique and materiality, um, education, and other aspects of um, pertaining to the craft world. So we've had three of our presentations already, and Shaniqua and Jennifer are here for our final presentation of this season. Uh, we're very excited to have them. Um, just before we start, I have a little housekeeping. So there are going to be two presentations, one after the other, and then we're going to leave time at the end for Q&A. So if you do have questions, um, you'll notice there's a chat and a Q&A. So if you have questions for the artists that we can ask at the end, please put those in the Q&A. Um, if you want to just make a comment or um, you know, chat along the way, um, that's what the chat is for. So um, as we start, please make sure that your um, audio and your cameras are off and we will begin with Shaniqua. So mm -hmm. Shaniqua calls herself an art artpreneur. She received her master's of design in fashion, body and garment at School of Art Institute of Chicago under the mentorship of Nick Cave. As the founder of Weave Your Dreams into Reality Studios, she highlights her gifts, services, knowledge, and shares her stories with the world one thread at a time. Shanique was received a Wingate Lamar Fellowship from the Center for Craft in 2014 and their Craft Career Advancement Fellowship in 2022. She's also the 2017-2018 recipient of the inaugural Young Arts Daniel Arsham Fellowship. She's participated in numerous shows and has current and upcoming shows planned far into the future. As you'll soon find out, Shanique was a ball of energy and it's a bit out of date to call her an emerging artist because indeed she seems to have fully arrived. So we are so very happy to welcome Shaniqua. Thank you, thank you. Wow, thank you Rebecca for the introduction. I need to bring you on the road with me <laughs> to introduce me. Thank you everybody for being here. I'll be speaking with you all from Chicago. Um, and I'm just going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to be speaking about quite a few things, sort of like my trajectory um, in my practice, how I've come to get to where I'm at today, um, where I want to go as well. So I'll be talking a bit about my travel, family, um, several bodies of work, as well as the fellowships along the way that has granted me great opportunities to get to where I'm at. Starting with where I was born. I was born in Charlotte Amali Hospital in St. Thomas, the US Virgin Island. My dad's side of the family is from St. Thomas and St. Martin. My mom's side of the family is from St. Kitts and Nevis, where I would visit on occasion during Christmas holiday because that's where we celebrate Carnival, which is a two month long um, of festivities. I was raised in Miami, Florida, and I have been groomed at a very young age to become an artist from attending the Magnet Art Program at Norland Middle to attending also New World School of the Arts, Performing Arts High School, where I was also taught by college professors in visual arts. From there, I decided that I wanted to pursue my bachelor's in fibers and textiles at the Kansas City Art Institute in Kansas City, Missouri. This is where I fell in love with weaving and decided to experiment with weaving synthetic hair. 
My first solo exhibition, Synthetic Ties, was an exhibition performance at Silver Screen Hair Salon in Kansas City, Missouri. This performance shined a light on sisterhood, the bond shared between two women, such as the client and hairstylist, capturing the involvement and dialogue of getting one's hair done. These are the two pieces, um, a part of the Synthetic Braids collection. So these are all woven on a floor loom and it is with synthetic braiding hair. So the hair is not real. These are the other two pieces that are a part of the Synthetic Cuts collection. And you can see more works within these collections on my website. In the spring of 2014, I was awarded the prestigious Wingate Lamar Fellowship from the Center for Craft in Asheville, North Carolina. I was awarded $15,000 to go pursue my project, which was to learn how to weave traditional Ghanaian textiles by master weaver Sebastian Dai in Ghana, West Africa. I lived there for three months and Sebastian, as you can see here alongside myself, was teaching me how to dress the horizontal loom. This is a video of my very first time weaving on the horizontal loom. Um, I was learning how to weave the more Gigi cloth, which is considered a plain weave. Um, more Gigi cloth is a way for a plain weave pattern, and it means one long road. It's never ending. So this is a video of me one month and a half into my apprenticeship. So I just really wanted to show you all sort of how I began, sort of like just getting acclimated, adjusting to a new loom, a new way of making. So then now a month and a half in, you can see I'm very comfortable. I know what I'm doing. I'm learning complex patterns and I'm just doing it. This is another pattern I learned called Soge. And it is Ewe for a net light pattern. And this is a detailed shot that I took of that pattern. So it's sort of like little squares. This is an image of Grandma Hilaria and I. So Grandma Hilaria is the one that hosted me in 2014 for the time that I lived in Anloga. Um, so I stayed by her house and I was dressed up to go to the Hobetsu Festival, which is celebrated by chiefs and people of the Anlo and the Volta region. Many people from other countries come over and it's celebrated the first Saturday of November. And what you see before you, um, how I'm dressed, Grandma Hilaria dressed me in her textiles um, and her jewelry. And all the jewelry was real. It may look light on me, but they were very heavy agri beads and real gold between 18 to 24 karat gold I wore. So basically you dress up in the finest of cloth um, jewelry and you just represent and show out for where you're um, coming from. These are images I took myself on my phone um, around the house when I was staying in Ghana or on travel throughout my journey there for the three months. Um, this is sort of like my way of a vision board or a Pinterest board, sort of inspiration for me to look back. So when I got back from Ghana, I went back to Kansas City, Missouri, and I stayed um, I was awarded the Charlotte Street Studio Residency as well, so I had a year-long free studio to work in, um, and this is what I put together on my travels um, prior. And these are some more images that I gathered as inspiration, just sort of me to reflect and kind of figure out where I wanted to go within the work. So, Nick Cave. The reason I'm in Chicago and decided to go to grad school. So I wanted to share with you all a little bit about him. He was born in Fulton, Missouri and lives and works in Chicago today. He's an artist, educator, and foremost a messenger working between the visual and performing arts through a wide range of mediums, including sculpture, installation, video, sound, and performance. Cave's work is well known for his sound suits, sculptural forms based on the scale of his body, initially created in a direct response to the beliefs beating of Rodney King in 91. So I've, I've admired um, Nick's work since I was a sophomore in high school. 
And I thought, why not work with him in graduate school? So after the residency at Charlotte Street in Kansas City, I just really wanted to change. I really wanted to relocate. Um, I felt like I reached my peak. I saw the same people everywhere. Um, I just wanted something different. I wanted to challenge myself. So I decided I wanted to go to grad school. Upon making that decision, I wanted to work with Nick and I found out that he worked um, in the design program for you to get your master's in design for fashion, body and garment at the Art Institute here in Chicago. So it immediately made sense that I work alongside him um, and be mentored underneath him. So I decided that was the only school that I needed to apply for and that's exactly what I did and I got accepted. Um, speaking of grad school, this is the thesis work that I left for grad school called Sacred Clocks, and it's basically digitally documenting the women in my life, working, cooking, cleaning, gossiping, and celebrating in domestic spaces. I proceeded to take those archived images and transform them into a pattern on Photoshop that is then woven on the jacquard loom. So this is Sacred Cloth 1. This is sacred cloth two. And this is sacred cloth three. Now these cloths are performed on the body in relation to the sound of me weaving, symbolizing courage, power, pain, strength, and love taking from the relationships built between me and the women in my life. And you can check out the sacred cloth performance on my website where you would see the performer Stevie Stevens wearing all three simultaneously and the, chore the choreography is done by me. Fast forwarding a little bit. Now at this point I've graduated. In the fall of 2017, I received a random phone call when I was at one of my lowest points and just frustrated with the fact of not being able to be a full-time artist. Little did I know in the midst of all that frustration and uncertainty that a blessing came my way that changed my life to date. The call said that I was awarded the inaugural 2017 and 2018 Young Arts Annual Fellowship, which awarded me $25,000 unrestricted, meaning I can do whatever I want with the money, thanks to the Ridinger and McLaughlin family, as well as a one-year mentorship with Daniel Arsham himself. So just to give you guys a little um, perspective, I did not apply for this fellowship. I literally randomly got a phone call saying that I unanimously was chosen as one of the first fellows. Daniel Arsham is based in New York and his work straddles the line between art, architecture and performance. Architecture is a prevalent subject throughout his work, environments with eroded walls, stairs going nowhere, landscapes where nature overrides structures and a general sense of playfulness within existing architecture. So this is an image of Daniel alongside one of his pieces in his studio. Working at my own pace on a new body of work at this point, I'm already got this fellowship and I'm happy to be making more in the studio. Little did I know another blessing out of this fellowship came um, along my way and Young Arts called me up and asked if I would love to be a part of Expo Chicago in 2018 where I was able to get a, my own booth, all expense paid. I was able to receive all proceeds from my sales, 100%. And it was just a win-win opportunity. I was like, of course. So here's a video showing a little bit of that. My name is Shaniko Brooks, and I'm a 2011 Young Arts winner in visual arts, and I'm the inaugural Daniel Arsham Fellow. I was raised in a single um, parent home, and my mother and my aunts, and just basically women. So me just being engulfed in that love and caring really naturally facilitated my take on the African-American diaspora as well as the Caribbean diaspora. So we're here at Expo where Shaniqua is showing the works that are the result of this fellowship. She had experimented um, with it in different scales and we talked a lot about the material and the process and other ways of displaying the work as well. What I admire most about her is her honesty and that transcends into her work. It tells a story uh, and in a, in a way it's, it's very timeless. It's changed my life and I know that it's gonna change so many other people. Um, this exhibition allowed more visibility on my work and practice in Chicago and throughout the US because people from all over the country attended the fair. So I got more visibility here. 
Um, these are two pieces, um, b and &B Bantu knots on your left and multi blonde loose onions on your right. So b and &B sold at the um, fair. Then later on, I was invited in the fall of 2020 by Jared Lynch, director and owner of High Noon Gallery in the Lower East Side of New York, invited me to have my own solo exhibition um, on September 9th through October 17th, 2021. So Still Here, which is the title of the exhibition, references perseverance, but also delves specifically into the stages of grief, which also perseveres, and which is a constant condition of being a Black woman in America. Tracing the structural system of the tapestries, I invite the viewer through a nonlinear patchwork of memory, as well as its limitations. More than autobiographical, the memories are also part of a system that I share with Black women. The color palette is still and still here is dominated by Blacks and earth tones, punctuated by strands of red, blue, and purple. The primary colors representing anger and depression, while the secondary color represents bargaining. Gold, a fourth color representing at its highest form of enlightenment, is used in combination with the palette to create layered meanings about wisdom through pain. Karami Black, the piece before you, is the combination of gold and black signifying luxury and wealth. Other works are more three-dimensional and confrontational. In Red Wine Drip, this piece um, shows large swaths of woven planes like tendons, create a densely layered but meticulously crafted object part architectural and part portraiture. Long Swoop Black is decorative, seductive, and menacing, referencing a mixed vocabulary of tribal adornments. A crown of red and blue emerges from the center, playing a role of self-portrait and paying homage to my Chicago-based hairstylist, Derricka Crum, who designs my crown and who I take inspiration from. The use of synthetic braiding hair and high quality blends in conversation with the more kinky puff hair speaks to the Black hair salon and my upbringing around what's good and bad hair. The differing material operates as a push and pull between positive and, and negative space. In 2021, I was invited by 108 Contemporary to have a solo exhibition. So now I welcome you all to be a part of the virtual tour of Wove, a trajectory of how, why, and where I wove from April 1st through May 22nd of this year. Due to time, I'm going to cut it a bit short, but you feel free to watch the virtual tour on my website um, for Wove, but I wanna get into some of the pieces a little bit. So Wove is really about my family's cultural background, conversations with others, and my Ghanaian experience influencing my art practice. So my art is born from the, tra from the traditional craft of weaving and then transitions into sculpture, performance, textile, and installation. Weaving with synthetic hair and cotton is my way of visually communicating with others. These visual communications are like love letters. And my baby sister, Takia Brooks, is where it began. She would braid my hair for hours on the couch while sitting on a pillow between her legs. It was an intimate experience shared between the both of us. We took care of each other, we listened to each other, and we talked to one another with love and compassion. Over the years, weaving the story shared with family and friends one thread at a time expanded and became bigger than myself. The conversation starts with me and continues with the viewer who engages with the work. 
Wove encapsulates the moments, experiences, conversations, writings, and traveling with others. Cocoon, the piece you see before you, was done in 2012. And if you could believe it or not, this was my very first weaving project I've ever done after learning on the sample. Now where I'm at today, um, my family, the beginning, I'm working right now on a new project for my family. It's a series of custom woven image-based art pieces that shines a light on my Caribbean roots. This project will take about three to five years to make and showcases family members on my mom and dad's side, including extended family I inherited along the way. I plan to travel next week to St. Martin, the West Indies, to visit my grandmother and gather research that will inform the next steps of this project, which I am so, so excited for. I plan to have a minimum of 100 pieces that will be hopefully able to travel because my goal is to have a traveling exhibition starting off in the Caribbean and then to the US locations where my family resides. So stay tuned for that in the coming years. Thank you. And feel free to look at my website for more information, my Instagram at Shaniqua. I also have Facebook, Shaniqua, and my email, Weave Your Dreams into Reality. There he goes. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, that was, that was really, really great. Um, I love that you have this wide array of materials and techniques and sources and that you're combining, um, elements of your personal life and traditional techniques, but then bringing in, um, newer things like computer aided technology, and it's all combining into these beautiful and really powerful, uh, emotional pieces. So, um, and I also like that, you're putting out this energy and positivity in the world and it's obviously coming back to you in, in great ways and, and giving you new opportunities and uh, new relationships. So wonderful, <laughs> congratulations. Um, now we're gonna turn our attention to Jennifer Trask. Uh, Jennifer completed her BFA in metalsmithing in 1993 earned an MFA in 1997. She's been a full-time studio artist. Um, she's recently returning to being in the studio with a new perspective on her work. Jennifer creates elaborate objects and sculptures made of found materials like bone, wood, and antlers, which simultaneously point to a traditional work in the mode of Dutch vanitas and also create fresh new ways of merging art and nature. Examples of Jennifer's work can be found in many public collections, including the Renwick Gallery, the Museum of Art and Design, uh, the Coda Museum in the Netherlands, the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, Australia, and, uh, <laughs> and many more. So uh, without further ado, welcome Jennifer Trask. Thank you, I am so glad to be here. Wow, I wish I could see you all. Um, I'm about to do something that is really scary. I'm gonna share some very personal stuff because it has affected my work. So bear with me while I figure out how to share my screen. Okay. Okay, can, all right, here we are. Hopefully you are just seeing my slides and nothing else. Tell me if it's otherwise. No, you're all good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is all very new to me. So this is a picture of where I was living for the last seven years with my husband, Robert. Uh, we just this week moved into the studio here in upstate New York. We moved back here because of a very challenging, life-changing diagnosis in 2020. Um, Robert was diagnosed with amyloidosis, and it's a relatively new to the medical field condition. There is no cure, and it has affected his heart, but there are studies being done and in various hospitals. We decided to move back to New York so that he could participate in a study at Columbia and hopefully they'll find a cure. Anyway, and I'm not telling you this for reasons of self-pity or sympathy. I'm telling you because there's simply no way around the fact that it really affected my work these last few years. So here's some 
some something that might look familiar to all of you. This is similar to some work I was doing in 2015, 16, which is when the uh, the Renwick Invitational occurred. This is a newer piece. In 2017, I had a, a show with Gallery Loop in uh, New York for uh, collective design. This is about nine feet tall. It's called accretion. It's both noun and verb. It describes both the objects and my process. Not just the material or debris, but an accretion of experience and emotion. And here's a detail. Here's a note on uh, materials and intent. Limestone is a sedimentary rock composed mainly of skeletal fragments of marine organisms, uh, such as mollusks, uh, corals. The primary materials are the minerals calcite and argonite, which are different crystal forms of calcium carbonate. Most of you probably know that our bodies function through mineral balances like potassium and sodium and calcium. It's what keeps our neurons working and our hearts beating. And it's also just a, an elemental part of all of my work. While I was making this body of work, Robert was experiencing different challenges and I was learning a lot of medical jargon. I happened to study, uh, stumble upon this article. I think I lost the source. I think it's uh, National Geographic. During church renovations in the 19th century, a small lead box was discovered beneath Richard the Lionhearted uh, a statue, I think. It was a, a little, so this little lead box had a phrase that says, here is the heart of Richard, King of England. And then it's, and inside the box, um, there was a powder, a rusty powder and forensic analysis conducted on this powder showed traces of linen, herbs, flowers, lime, and iron oxide, blood essentially. So this piece is called Amor Sempiternus. It's encaustic on wood, steel, sewing needles, lead and iron oxide powder under the glass. Here, here's a detail. You can see that the, the leaves, the ornamentation that is lead and steel, it's meant to reference some tapestries from around the time. I believe it was the 1600s, I'm not sure. So um, apparently this was a very common practice between husbands and wives, especially to exchange hearts. Uh, when a husband died, his heart would be preserved in this lead coffin. And then when the wife died, they exchanged the hearts, put one in the other's body and buried them together. I, I know it sounds grotesque, but it's also really incredibly romantic in a strange way. And here's another version, um, a more Sempiternus two. This one's 13 by 13, three and a half inches deep. Again, encaustic iron oxide, rust, lead, inlaid druzy quartz sewing needles um, and an antique lens. Here's just a group shot of some of the encaustics and a neck piece. This is loop necklace from 2017 from that same show at Collective. Uh, if you stretched it out flat, it would be about 14 inches. The central part of the pendant is maybe five inches around two inches deep. It's bone, Tahitian pearls, freshwater pearls, cultured pearls, gold. And it very loosely references the flow of blood through the heart and oxygenation with that color change. This one's called cochlea cordis, the cockles of my heart. It's both an object and dependent. 
It's bone, antler, shell, resin, garnet, spinel, South Sea, freshwater, Tahitian pearls, uh, palladium gold. I, I really lavished attention and spared nothing on these materials. These, these hearts were becoming something else. So here it is removed from the, the pearl necklace. It fits roughly inside my hand. I'm sorry I didn't include a, a picture of it held in my hand. It is roughly the size of a human heart. And when you wear it, it sits over your heart. And here's just another angle. First documented use of the phrase cochlea cordis was in the 1600s. And it's thought to be a corruption of the Latin for cochlea, ventricles. And that's due to the resemblance of cockles to hearts. Anyway, I call this one my heart because I grew up on Cape Cod and here on the back is a laser etched map. Uh, looks like part of Provincetown. So this is where I grew up. And this was just a deeply personal piece and I still have it. I can't seem to part with it. These are just sketches from my notebook at the time. Now I have still been making large scale work and smaller work simultaneously. This page caught my attention because I have a little note up in the right hand corner. I'm not sure if anyone can see that, but it says, why jewelry? Well, it's the intimate scale. It's the permission to touch that you don't get with larger sculptures. And uh, the site and the subject is the body. I still think that's very powerful. Here's another little sketch of something in the work. So now I'm gonna show you a couple more pieces that are finished, but we're going into new territory. Uh, this is a Crescio cordis, also an object and pendant, bone and gold. The chain is meant to resemble loosely sinus rhythms, sound waves, some sort of charting or graphing. Medical imagery has always been a source of fascination for me. And if you're familiar with my older work, you will have seen some of that. And here it is on its own. Acrecio cordis translates to adhesive pericarditis in which there are adhesions extending from the pericardium to the chest wall. And I think of that, you know, just as another allegory for attachment and for how our heart grows fond or attached to people, places. Here it is for scale. And then this one's called root neck piece, an object. Again, it comes off of the hanging mechanism, which is a uh, vintage Japanese woven silk belt. The pendant itself is antler, bone, shell, pearls, sterling silver, coral, and resin. It's about 21 inches when you lay it out flat, and the pendant is eight inches tall. It's a pretty hefty object. When you wear these, you know you're wearing them. So during the pandemic, like many, I was feeling isolated, and I didn't have a studio assistant, naturally. So I worked very, very slowly on my own. And uh, this one is called Vanitas. I took the time to lavish the attention on the objects I was building as if growing them in a garden. This is the last piece I finished before we moved to New York. So in it, gosh, there's so much. It's all mostly found objects, wood, antler, bones, teeth, shells, wasps nest, unknown mineral pearls, um, with a removable object. The overall dimensions of this piece, 42 by 20 inches by eight inches. It's, um, it's not big, but it's not small. It's a three-dimensional vanitas. And it's, for people who don't know, a vanitas um, is a painting that is 
they were typically done in the 15 and 1600s. And they are meant to be reminders of the certainty of death, the fragility of life. So there would typically be flowers, rotten fruit to symbolize aging, uh, jewelry and wealth, wealthy items that would symbolize the vanities that you can't take with you. So in this piece, there's all of that. There's jewelry, there's pearls. Um, there are pearls that seem to have been absorbed by the growth of the tree, of the vine. They're in the wood, they're in some of the weaves. There's snail shells, there's pearls that are meant to look like insects or larvae. Of course, there are flowers made of bone and beaver's teeth. There's a key. And this is the heart that you can remove from that curved vine at the top. It's not anatomically correct. It's a, just a, it could be, it looks more like an animal heart, actually. It looks very much like a rabbit heart. I was looking at a lot of images of anatomical hearts over this past couple of years. And I'm not really 100% sure what that heart is doing there. Except to say that my work has always focused on nature and our relationship to it, that we see ourselves as separate from it. And we really are not. We think we have dominion over it and we do not. And so I think this was that final step for me to incorporate myself, ourselves in that cycle in nature. I recently came across a review by Maria Popova on her blog, The Marginalian of a book called Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole by writer Susan Cain. She posits that longing is the fulcrum of creativity. In her words, the bittersweet is an authentic and elevating response to the problem of being alive in a deeply flawed yet stubbornly beautiful world. Most of all, bittersweetness shows us how to respond to pain by acknowledging it and attempting to turn it into art the way musicians do, or healing or innovation or anything else that nourish, nourishes the soul. Or these are indeed complex nuanced matters beyond easy binaries, murky even as a spectrum. Where does melancholy end and the deadening black of depression begin, the bittersweet the enchanted liminal weave is the tapestry of meaning. And it's, it's really about living with beauty, the beauty and the pain and holding them both side by side, grief and joy. And I think that we've all been struggling with that during this pandemic. And I think that these pieces are my approach to dealing with what we're all going through universally and personally. Now I'm showing you something that's unfinished. It's another heart. It's not done yet on the left. You can see there are gold veins. I took it a step further and I decided to x-ray these pieces. This is an experiment that feels like it might lead somewhere where I don't know. I don't nor normally show people unfinished work and I was very uh, nervous about it today and I hope that you find it interesting. So that x-ray that you're seeing now, that's my hand with the object that I just showed you a few slides ago. It's bone, shell, gold. And here's another unfinished object. From what I can tell so far, I am trying to work through what we're all going through. And this one is going to be ultimately stitched together. You can see how it curls with gold thread. And here it is in my hand in x-ray form. Kane writes, longing is momentum in disguise. It's active, not passive, touched with the creative, the tender and the divine. We long for something. For someone, we reach for it, we move toward it. The word longing 
comes from Old English langian, meaning to grow long, and the German langen, to reach or extend. Interestingly, the word yearning is linguistically associated with longing and hunger and thirst, but also desire. When I read that this morning, I thought, wow, I'm making these images and it certainly looks like I'm, I'm reaching for something. I'm longing for something and having not had a studio for so long and having the desire to work, but not be able to work has really, um, well, things are brewing, let's put it that way. And I can understand now that my work has always come from a place called the bittersweet, a place where you care enough to act. Uh, and my work was always about nature and always about us. I'm looking forward to finding where this is going or following the thread. This x-ray is of me holding that stitched heart in front of my own. I wish I could heal and cure what's going on in the world. I wish I could cure diseases and save the planet and make a new heart for my love. But I can only live in this bittersweet and uh, bear witness. I look forward to following where these new ideas lead me and I I hope that you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think all of us really, really appreciate um, what what you're going through and how you're um, working through it with your art. Um, and I love that your your pieces are called um, accretions because they're not just accretions of physical parts, but they're just accretions of your emotions and deep acquired knowledge and, um, uh, you know, just physically, literally, figuratively, emotionally accretions and, and, you know, what you're putting your whole self into your art. So it's really um, fascinating and, and we appreciate hearing about it. Um, boy, I'm gonna turn to some of the uh, questions that we have. Um, so uh, the, the, something that we covered a little bit yesterday in the um, discussion on, on how uh, Shaniqua and Jennifer make their work um, is the materials. And Rebecca Cross is asking, can you talk a little bit about um, the beautiful objects on your desk? And um, other people are asking sort of if you can talk about the sources of, of your materials a little bit. Either, both of you. Well, everyone asks me about where do I get my bone? <laughs> and yesterday I addressed that um, we, I get a lot of it from hunters directly. Um, I've collected so much over the years. I have boxes and boxes of antlers and bones and teeth, all kinds of things that people have given me or I've purchased. Um, and I don't know if you're talking about the objects behind me, this is another wall piece. Um, this one's called Thrive. And this was also something I finished during the pandemic. It, it was a smaller, much smaller piece. It's now pretty big. It's about five feet. And it is uh, gilt wood, bone, antler. And it's, it's one of these allegories about uh, what happens when you mess with mother nature. Mm. Mm. And Shaniqua, um, how about you? You're working with some unusual materials too. Yeah, so um, as far as the synthetic braiding hair, they come in packs um, and I get them from the beauty supply store, um, usually in black neighborhoods. <laughs> so I live on the south side of Chicago, so they're everywhere, easily accessible. Sometimes I do order depending on how much I need. Um, at the time, um, I do order a large quantity off of Amazon just for, you know, the time of me not carrying so much in one sitting. But usually I get inspiration from attending the beauty supply store, just going to hair salons. Um, as far as like yarn, cotton, you know, I order them offline as well. Um, and I use primarily black cotton because um, anything that I put against it stands out. So it's just something that I love to use, but yeah. 
Great. Um, so Tim has a couple of questions, Tim Tate. So first of all, um, he says that uh, two of his biggest idols are Nick Cave and Daniel Arsham. So oh, he wow. wants to, yeah, he wants to know how was it to work with them? Uh, yeah. And then also for Jen, he wants to um, ask, how, how do you find someone to take your x-ray pictures for you? <laughs> <laughs> so first um, one, then the other. <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, working with Nick as his student was difficult. <laughs> he was very hard on me. Oh my God. Um, but I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> And today, I can honestly say I have no regrets. That was the best decision I've made um, in my career and the greatest investment, in fact, in my education, because that was not a cheap bill at all, um, going to grad school. But it was um, an insightful experience. I feel now being graduated since 2017 till now, I have a better perspective on what went down. Um, I've had several conversations with him since then that I wish the program was three years instead of two because I started to get somewhere in my practice and way of thinking right when I left. Um, so that was that. Daniel Arsham is great. Um, very, 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 very busy man. Um, <laughs> so it was nice to have a day with him. Um, in New York, in his studio, sit down. I brought a piece of mine at the time before Expo while it was in progress to talk with him about, you know, presenting it and things like that. He's very, very down to earth type of person. Um, same thing with Nick too. I felt that both of them at different points in my career thus far um, has helped me through just being honest in conversation, transparent, even though they're very successful right now, they're very much like, oh yeah, this is gonna go down or this is gonna you know, happen. And it, it's, it's been a joy and it's nice to know I have um, access to them. Great, thank you. Um, hang on, we do have more questions. Oh, Jennifer, what did you get your x-ray? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, right, who, who exactly. Who did that? I wanna uh, know. <laughs> I, I, I've talked a few people into doing that over the years. Um, can't say. I understand. Okay, cool. cool. All right. Um, does anybody else have some questions? You can type them in. Um, I had a question and now I think you actually answered it. Jennifer, you um, had that little uh, note in the corner of your notebook about why you like um, jewelry and adornment. But I'm wondering if there's, um, can you sort of talk about the difference in, um, you know, technique or, or perspective or how you need to think about the difference between making something small handheld versus some of the much, you know, the five foot by five foot pieces and the big installations? Uh, well, the jewelry is a lot quicker, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes I shoot myself in the foot because I work like a jeweler on the big pieces. So each one of these flowers is put together one at a time, you know, petal by petal by petal. I've had to learn some shortcuts. It just takes a lot longer. It takes many hands. And I, I do like the feeling that this, I, I really wish you could see it in person. It really, it's reaching out from the wall significantly about 50 mm -hmm. inches and it, you, you, it becomes overwhelming and that's a very different experience than the intimacy of holding an object and oftentimes jewelry also holds associations memories you know, talismanic if you will they function very differently but uh, they're equally powerful to me great so tim uh, um also uh we're, as we all are, I'm um, sorry to hear about your husband and he's sending healing thoughts, but he's asking about, um, he says the show you did together, Dead or Alive at MAD was still one of his favorites. And he wants to know if you're gonna be showing at Miami this December. I currently don't have representation for my large works. And I am working with Gallery Loop with the smaller pieces and and she's, Patty has graciously shown my larger works, but she's not going to Miami. so. Yeah, I, you know, I've been in transition for the last five years, it feels like. Not sure, Tim, but I would love to see you and I'd love to show with you. 
Uh, so Lucian Perkins wants to know if you're um, thinking about Rococo when you're putting together your larger works. Well, definitely, because I'm using some authentic Rococo parts. I mean, these, some of the wood parts are antiques that I find that are damaged and put back together. It's, it's about um, exuberance. It's about untamed growth. Yeah, I think you captured that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Are there any other um, questions or comments for our fabulous artists? Uh, oh, okay. So KZ put a question in the chat. Um, Jennifer, I know you told us about the piece on the wall behind you. I think Rebecca Cross was also asking about, oh, on the piece on your right on the table, the one like the spinning mirror. Okay. This is called Suture. Let's see if I can get closer without unplugging anything. Um, it's meant to be like an embroidery hoop. And there are four sections of deer skulls. And every skull has, uh, every mammal skull has sutures. And we have five pieces so that they can bend and flex when they go through the birth canal. And then as you get older, they fuse. So that's what all these sutures, these zigzaggy lines are. I don't know if you can see that. So what I've done is I've put together four of these skulls and then I've uh, embedded woven gold thread. The question is, and, and here's a little needle made out of bone. Um, is it being put together? Is it being sewn together or unraveled? I don't know. Wow. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, so Lucian is also asking for Shaniqua. Um, are you about creating your version of a sacred geometry in your patterns? Okay. Some esoteric yeah. questions, folks. Okay, come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I, I feel that I am. Um, I've said this quite often in talks lately that I need to come up with a term for the patterns that I create um, and my own meaning, because I do take inspiration from um, not just Ghanaian, traditional Ghanaian textiles, but even before me going to Ghana to do my um, apprenticeship with Sebastian, um, I would take inspiration from Overshot. Um, and I absolutely love Overshot. And I think that um, what comes from it, I would take four or five existing patterns and I'll create my own. And I love um, geometric shapes. I love a good triangle and a square and, you know, a diamond or whatever, and just making it my own. So, um, so yeah, I'm definitely doing just that. Okay, let me see if we have any other questions. All right. Does, uh, Last chance, folks, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A or the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and close up by, by um, saying again, a big thank you to both uh, Jennifer and Shaniqua. And I know that um, for both of you, you're extremely busy and, and in transition. And, and you really, um, when we asked you to, um, to do this paired presentation, you didn't know each other. So you had to really take some time to get to know each other and and you talked a lot and and put in a lot of uh very thoughtful uh time and energy to uh put together this presentation and i feel like you've taken us through art and craft and biology chemistry <laughs> literature history mathematics religion so this has been a fantastic way to spend an afternoon um and, and again, we uh, thank everybody for joining us. We thank the artists and our co-hosts at American University. And um, JRA has uh, one more summer activity coming up. It's a trip to Boston and we always get um, great uh, behind the scenes um, tours and visits to artist studios and museums and things. So check us out at jra.org. And otherwise, um, stay tuned. We'll be back next season with four more um, distinguished artists in our series. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.